Hi everybody, I'm Don Dixon and we're here finishing up our discussion on humps. In our overall master class on structure, we established in the beginning there's really three categories. There's uh, bars, there's humps, and then there's man-made structure. And this is going to be our last discussion on humps. We had established there were five different structures that go into this category. Three of the main type of humps which have deep water on all four sides and then we also included hump-like structure that aren't pure in that sense of deep water four sides but rather we have a, a delta situation which has deep water only on one side. And then of course we have the saddle which we talked about last week that has deep water on two sides. But all hump-like in their appearance and how we're going to fish them and how we interpret them. Uh, keeping in mind that fish will never go downhill to get shallow. That was one of the things we talked about. And first I want to clear one thing up before we, we get on to our mid-leg hump. We talked briefly about deltas and we showed you what it was and how to fish it and so on and so forth and I said that the main key to fishing a delta is where you have a side feeder stream cut that comes down off the hill and cuts through that flat, cuts through the valley of flat, and intersects with the main river channel and creates what we studied back when we were talking about flatland reservoirs when we were studying bars. It creates a two-sided bar. But most importantly in a delta situation, it gives the fish a route to get to the shallows and more importantly to get back to their sanctuary zone. And the reason it's so key in a delta is we keep in mind that that delta is formed and shaped like that and those fish won't come up over the delta down the back side to get shallower. They just won't do it. So this side feeder stream cut, 95% of the time it's your key. 98% of the time it's your key to the contact point. Because that side feeder stream cut where it intersects creating the two-sided bar gives the fish a route. Some of my old fishing buddies called me up and said, we saw that segment and you need to uh, remind them that there is one other place, there's actually a couple other places where fish could uh, be using and be caught in that delta that does not have anything to do with a side feeder stream cut. They reminded me of something I taught them years ago. So I am going to mention it before we leave the deltas. And I have a couple of slides, old slide pictures from my old schools that shows one of the places where you can find some fish on a delta where there's no side cut. And this is where you have a tree line that was an old farm country and this is in a lowland too so it's farming country. So a lot of those tree lines still exist and if the tree line is in uh, the same sort of uh, level of of uh, uh, depth of water, the fish can come up over that delta, follow that tree line into a shoreline area. That's possible. That's one way. The other thing is, and as an old, excuse me, as an old pheasant hunter from Pennsylvania, I can't tell you how many times I'm walking an old fence row with my trusty Irish setter and shooting pheasants. <laughs> uh, and, and again, in some of these old farm lowlands, uh, there'll be an old fence row that was left there when they flooded the reservoir. And again, that will give the fish a route. They can actually follow the fence row, just like my trusty Irish setter used to do. Uh, and so there are a couple of other places, but these are, the, the, these are not the rule, they're the exception. The rule is if I'm going to, if I'm establishing a lowland reservoir, I'm looking for side feeder stream cuts, period, 100% of the time. If in trolling, that hump-like feature, that one-sided hump, remember we talked about trolling a one-sided bar, that's how we troll a delta, we troll on a one-sided hump. Deep water only on one side, we troll the top of that hump, where it's breaking. So as we're trolling that thing and all of a sudden we catch a fish and there's no side feeder cut, I'm going to investigate why is that fish there. He's there for a reason. And we could maybe find that fence row or that tree line. And that would give the fish a route. We could have school fish right there. So 
Again, that's the exception. The rule is look for the side feeder stream cuts when fishing at Delta Reservoir. Okay, moving on. I promised you today we were going to talk about star hump. This was a hump that we used uh, just one time that I know of in our training at our summer school. And we call it star hump because of how it looked when we did a detailed map of it. I'm going to explain that to you, but let me first establish this is a mid-lake hump. And normally when we say a mid-lake hump, first thing we're looking for is what side of the hump is the deep water. Well, in the case of this mid-lake hump, there was deep water on all four sides and it was the same depth. Even traveling for quite a distance, it stayed the same depth. All the way around this thing was about 70 feet of water. So, we had different possibilities as to where the contact point might be. Now, backing up just a little bit, this structure was in Gun Lake. And it was one of the first structures that my partner Tommy went to map while I was going the other direction. And he went out and he did a quick, he established the hump to begin with because it had a uh, one of those, you know, kind of a red buoy on it that was uh, saying, hey, look out, this is shallow, what's your prop? And I think it came up to about two feet. I mean, it came pretty darn shallow. But there were no weeds or anything. It was just pure rock and, and so on and so forth. So uh, it was sort of a warning thing, but he saw that marker, so he went out to investigate. Sure enough, there's this hump. It's quite large. Uh, and most importantly, he did a detailed map of it. Later, as we had put in our two or three weeks mapping this whole area up there, when I asked him about the stuff in Gun Lake, he said, there is a hump out there. And he said, but we're not going to use it. And he said, uh, it, it'll produce fish for sure. He said, but I just did a, a sort of a minimum detail map of it, and I eliminated it from my thinking, we can't use this. And here's, here was his reason. He said, when I got on the primary brake line, he said it was breaking real good. He said it breaking about 25 feet, broke again at like 37, and then again about 45 feet into, into this 70 feet of water. He said, this thing, you know, it produced fish. But he said, when I got on the primary brake line and started following to get the size and the shape, he said that thing went like this. He said, I kept going around this big old thing, and he said there was a finger there were so many fingers, he said, it was about like six, seven, eight fingers, all sticking out, all beautiful, all dropping at the same depth into deep water. He said, but because it's so intricate this way, he said, if we take some beginning mappers out there, they're just going to be confused. And they're going to probably lose interest and say, oh man, I could never do this. So at any rate, because it was so, <clears throat> in his mind, it was so difficult. We didn't want to confuse guys. We, we were wanting to have something a little more simple so that they get the procedures and get the idea so they could learn how to be good mappers. And he said, that's not going to do it. It's too tough. Okay. Well, we never used it. He didn't use it. I didn't use it in our training. We used, we found some other humps that were a little less difficult, but still you could show that they were productive and you could show uh, exactly what was there and, and demonstrate uh, and teach how to map. Keep in mind now, this mapping was such an important part. When you get sort of advanced fishermen coming to you and they really want to fine tune their skills and so on and so forth, the real area of study that's critically important and how they can really get better, how I can always get better, is in this area of mapping and interpretation. That's where we can always get better. So with that in mind, we want them to get the idea of how to do it and then practice on some stuff that's not quite so difficult and then graduate a little bit later on into the more difficult stuff. So at any rate, we never used this hump, but yet it wasn't, it was pretty close to uh, our lodge. So every person that ever came to our school, they had two things in mind. I think I mentioned it last week. They wanted to learn, but they also wanted to catch some big fish. And almost everybody said, I like to catch one 10 pounder. You know, we got that all the time. People would always use that 10 pounder, you know, as that's, that's the magic number. If they get one, they'd like to mount it, you know. And as we started this last week, there were 
I'd say there were probably 30 pretty educated guys. They'd either been with me before or had read all the material and they were pretty strong fishermen coming in. And But yet they all said the same thing. They wanted to learn, wanted to catch fish. Okay, great. First we work on the learning. Catching fish be automatic after that, but let's learn first. So we're pushing and pushing on this mapping. And there was one day where I realized it was a Friday and almost everybody in that class, I think everybody pretty much, had caught either an eight, nine, or a 10 pound walleye. And a lot of the guys, the more experienced guys, caught a bunch of big fish. Not just one, I mean lots of big fish were caught. But there was one fella who hadn't caught a big fish. And I knew that he is well read, he read all the material, he, he was really serious about his fishing. I'll tell you about him in a minute. But at any rate, he hadn't caught a big fish and, and he mentioned it to me that morning, that he was one of the few people who hadn't caught a really a, a hog walleye. And I said, well, maybe this afternoon you get to work on that down on, in the river, you know, down in the saddle where you can pretty much know that there's gonna be some big fish. He said, okay, uh, that'd, be, that'd be an idea and maybe I'll just do that and that was it. Well, we went out to do our mapping. We mapped a bar, like was my normal procedure. First we mapped a bar and I had four or five boats, I think I had five boats with me that day. And two guys each in a boat. And we mapped a bar, and then it was getting to be lunchtime, we were gonna go map a hump before we went to lunch. So I went in, uh, heading to another hump, but it was a little bit further away, and one of the guys said, I noticed a hump, it's just sort of real close to, to our lodge. It was a red buoy on it, why don't we go map that? Hump. And I said, where are you talking about? And then when he explained it a little bit further, I remembered Tommy had mapped this hump, said it was a little too difficult probably for the beginners, but I had some pretty experienced guys. So I said, okay, yeah, let's go. I know where that is. Let's go look at it. Keep in mind now, I hadn't seen it. I don't know anything about it. And Tommy didn't explain it other than it had a bunch of fingers on it. So we went up and established it, led to two feet, you know, we're sitting up there right around that red marker. And I said, now we got established, does it lead all the way? So we took our pass off and sure enough, it led to deep water. And I did a few loops and went off to hump this way and this way. And in each case, I ended up in 70 feet of water and traveled for a distance, all four directions, and it's still 70 feet. So I didn't have one spot that was 80 feet and everything else was 50. That would give me my fish. It was all the same. Since it was the same depth of water all the way around, I had to find the feature, that one feature, that would be my contact point. So I went out to the very first brake line. It kind of sloped off and so on and so forth and, and broke around 25 feet. So I got on that 20, it was either 22 20 to 25, somewhere in there, and break it. So I started following it. And like Tommy had told me, you know, that there was multiple fingers. Well, he didn't really explain it to me. It went like this. I mean, there were fingers. By the time I got all the way around that hump, I, I had established it has six major fingers, turns, mini bars. Now I had to establish which one was the best. By the way, if you haven't seen my video on mapping and interpretation of structure, it's right here on my channel, on YouTube. Look it up and check it out, and you'll have a better idea what I'm talking about here. But at any rate, I have to find what feature. I have to try to identify, remember, that exact spot, the contact point. So i got to find a feature. And there's a saying that we use in our mapping and in our, in our interpretation of structure. And that is the contact point will always be the longest, narrowest, sharpest, that's how fast it breaks, sharpest, deepest break, depth of water, to the deepest water area. That's going to be my contact point. Now, once you understand this whole idea of interpretation, you'll, you'll kind of figure out all of those things don't always come together. The longest always isn't the deepest, and the deepest isn't always the sharpest, and so on and so forth. So how do we determine then which one's best? Well, 
first thing you look at is where's the deepest water in the area? Well, in the case of Star Hump, it was all the same depth. So we eliminate that. And then we go to the next one. We're, we say it one direction and then we interpret it the other direction. Deepest water, it's all the same. The next we have to find the deepest break. Well, it all, all of the fingers, every one of them, broke at 45 feet into the deep water. They all broke at the same depth. So now we eliminate that. Now at first glance, the next one interpretation that we look at is which one breaks the sharpest? Well, as we went off and took soundings off all, they all looked about the same. So we kind of eliminated that. And then how about the narrowest? That's the next one that we look at. If all the others are equal, then what's the narrowest? They were all the same size. They were all about as big around as my dock. They were all the same size. We couldn't see anything different. They were all the same. So the next question then in our lineup, well, which one is the longest? Which one reaches out the furthest? Because that's always going to be the contact point. You know, if you imagine you're the fish, you're down in deep water. The first thing you're going to see when you're in your sanctuary zone, when you become active and move, the first thing you're going to see is the one that sticks out the furthest to you, the one that's coming the closest to you. That's the first one you're going to see, so that's going to be the contact point. So we started looking, which one's the longest? Oops, they're all the same. <laughs> Every one of those fingers was about 25, 30 feet long, turned back in. 25, 30 feet long, turn back in. They were all the same. So my saying of your contact point is going to be the longest, narrowest, sharpest, deepest break to the deepest water in the area. Every time, 100%, you've identified those fish. There they are. Well, in this case, we couldn't see one difference. Now I knew why Tommy said it's not a good training st structure. It's just not good. Those guys would be pulling their hair out trying to figure that one out. I really wanted to identify the contact point. So I said, listen, you guys sit here and talk about this a minute. I'm going to take one more sounding pass off of each one of these features. And we had thrown a marker on each one of those fingers. I said, I'm going to make one more pass. You just watch me. And I'm going to do it pretty quick. But I'm going to take one more pass off of each one, see if we can identify this thing. And if not, that's OK. We'll go eat lunch. We'll worry about it later. So. I go out and make off. I make these passes, and the one that was sort of off of this corner right here would be this corner of the dock right there. As I went off that one, the first time I thought I, that maybe broke a little bit sharper, a little more sudden, 45, 70, where the other ones were 45, 70. I said, let me repeat that pass. I came back up on it. The 70 feet, boom, 45. I reversed the pass on the other fingers. 70, mm, 45, more slopey, and 45. Now, it's breaking at 45, but the one off of this corner seemed to be sharper. So I came back in, and I sat there with my boys all we were all sitting around that red marker and I said guys if I had to bet I'd call it that one right there I think it breaks a little bit sharper but it's so close that most of the time you you wouldn't be able to figure it out you'd have to just think that it's that one and fish it and 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 let the fish verify what you're thinking or verify that that's not the spot but I'm betting that that's it, and I'm betting it that it's the sharpest. Everything else appears to be exactly the same. But with that being said, let's pick up these markers and let's go eat lunch. I let them pick up the markers. They were my markers, but I let them pick them up. I started in, and then these boats started struggling in behind me. And all come in, we're sitting up there eating lunch, and pretty soon the conversation led to that pump. And I said, you know what's strange? Because of all of the structures that I've mapped all over the country. When you map a structure, 
And like Buck used to do, take that and drill your finger in the water and say, there's my fish. It's always there. It's, that's the spot. If you follow your map and interpretation procedures, you will always arrive at that spot where th that's your last spot where you're checking all the speeds and if one, even one fish decides to stick his head up under that bad weather, you're going to catch him because you're throwing to the spot. So we were talking about, I said, that's a pretty confusing spot out there, that, that whole structure. I said, but I really think that one, and, and I took some sightings on it as well with the red thing and the two things in the side and I, I went to, to the right at a right angle like I talked about one time before with got my shoreline sightings on it and I planned on maybe in the evening going out and checking it just for the fun of it but at any rate we're about three-fourths of the way done with lunch I'm looking around I didn't see this one fellow that I mentioned earlier his name is Dave Bishop I think originally he was from Iowa I think he was living in Texas. So I forget where he was living now, but I think originally he was from Iowa, and he was dedicated. I mean, he, he could quote chapter and verse of this book. He had read it all, studied it all, and he had caught quite a few fish. But he was the one guy that week that hadn't caught a big walleye. And I know he wanted to catch one. So we almost done with lunch and I said, you know, we're having this discussion. Whatever happened to Dave? Did anybody see the Dave come in? He said, well, he was coming in when we came in. Well, he must have went up and took a nap or something. At any rate, okay, not going to worry about it. So we go down after lunch and I've got a new group coming. So I'm waiting for them down there, my new group. And when I hit the dock, we looked up and here come Dave Bishop in his boat coming back to the dock. At any rate, they had told me that David followed him in. But now here he is coming in again. He was coming from that direction. He came over and tied his boat up and I said, Dave, we were a little bit worried about you. You missed lunch, man. What's going on? He said, well, he said, I decided when I heard you say that maybe that evening you might come out and try to prove that that's the spot, I decided I'd just park my boat right there and throw to the one that you said you thought broke a little bit sharper. So even though I was a little bit hungry, when I got to the dock, I thought, I'm going to go out and fish that right now. Now, it's the middle of the day. It's noontime. He turned his boat around and went back out, and he got on that sighting that I had quoted before about Mark Dinah's sighting. And he anchored the boat and started throwing a heavy jig into that 70 feet of water, coming up over that one finger that looked like it broke sharper. And he said, let me show you what happened. And he pulled it out of the live well. And I, and I saw it the other day. I was looking through some old pictures and I found Dave's picture with that fish. He verified our interpretation of Star Home while we were in eating lunch. And not only did he verify it, but there was his big walleye for the week. So it couldn't have worked out better. And it was just one of those stories that reminded me, if you really work at your mapping, like Buck says, you can't interpret something that you don't have a detailed map. And that map you're getting from all of these different services now that shows you the contour, that made by a map maker. But the details you need to interpret a structure, you have to be able to interpret it so you know how to fish it. And that mapping, that we did on Star Hunt. Even though it was difficult, and probably one of the hardest things I'd ever made a determination on, most of the time it's very obvious where the contact point is. This time it wasn't quite as obvious, but the fish ended up proving it. We had the right spot, even though it was difficult. So, never forget what Buck says. Mapping is the key to interpretation. And interpretation of that deep water spot, contact point, is the key to knowledge. And knowledge is the key to fishing success. I can promise you, Dave Bishop, who afterwards, by the way, moved to Florida. He wanted to come down here and catch big bass. So uh, I guarantee you, he never forgot that episode, that moment when he hooked that fish off of that spot coming out of 70 feet into 47 feet a spot that we had drilled our finger in the water and said that's it 
See, you can do that too. Just like Dave now can do it. Uh, and it's those experiences, catching fish, that not only verifies, but puts, puts the, that knowledge in your head forever. The experience of catching that fish. The experience of catching fish once you drill your finger in the water at a spot where you said they were going to be and all of a sudden there they are. That's your confirmation to the knowledge, to what Buck says. That's your confirmation. Okay, before I let you loose today, I've been getting a lot of questions about the advanced material that we talked about in Buck's books and the first edition, it's still available. And all I can tell you, it's the best money you could ever spend in fishing. And please understand this. I came back out of my little retirement to try to help to educate the new generation of fishermen. I am not in the tackle business and I'm not in, the, I'm not in this business either. But if you ask me, how do I go from where I am now in my fishing? How do I go from there to catching big stringers of big fish almost every time I go fishing? I'm going to tell you. Take it from me. This material. Buck's lifetime of experience and material is right here. It's, it's less than the price of a halfway decent reel today. And it'll change your fishing. I promise you, it'll change your fishing. So, people have been asking me where they can get this stuff. Well, you get it at Buck's Base. Now, here's the deal. You can go to my website, dondixonfishing.com and link right into them. Or you can call Bucks Bates yourself and ask for Scott Jenkins. He owns the joint. And tell him Don Dixon sent you and he'll give you a special price on this material and anything else you want. So make that connection. Uh, you can't find this stuff anywhere else. So until the next time when we start talking about man-made structure, like us on Facebook and subscribe to our YouTube channel and we'll see you then.